Welcome to part one on Stokes' theorem. In this video, we'll define Stokes' theorem and then use Stokes' theorem to evaluate a line integral. In part two, we'll use Stokes' theorem to evaluate a surface integral. The idea of Stokes' theorem is similar to Green's theorem stated here. Remember, this tells us that the net rotation along the curve C is equal to the net rotation of the vector field in the region R, where R is in the xy plane. However, in Stokes' theorem, however, in Stokes' theorem, the region R becomes the surface S in 3D or in space. And under the proper conditions, we have this line integral here equal to the surface integral of the curl of F dotted with N. So Stokes' theorem states the relationship between line integrals and surface integrals of a vector field given specific conditions. And it tells us the net rotation over the surface is equal to the net rotation on the boundary C given certain conditions. So let's now talk about the necessary conditions to apply Stokes' theorem. If we have our surface here in gray, the vector field N, the unit normal vectors, must point in the same direction as your right thumb as your right fingers curl and point in the direction of the path of the boundary C. Looking at this diagram here, if our thumb is pointing upward in the same direction as the unit normal vectors, notice the fingers would point counterclockwise, giving this the correct orientation. And this is called a positive orientation, which is required by Stokes' theorem. Let's go ahead and formalize Stokes' theorem now. If S is an oriented surface with unit normal vectors N and also having a smooth closed boundary C with a positive orientation and the vector field F has components with continuous partial derivatives, then we have the line integral of F dotted with dr along C equal to the surface integral of the curl of F dotted with N ds. Remember the curl of F can be written like this, or we can also think of it as del crossed with the vector field F, because this form reminds us of how to determine the curl of F. Then remember from the video on the surface integral of a vector field, n differential s is equal to this vector field here times differential a, given we have a positive orientation. Remember, this really is just the gradient of big G, where big G is equal to z minus g of x and y. And because we have a vector field dotted with n, this is called a flux integral. And so we can say that the line integral around the boundary C equals the flux of the curl over the surface S. Let's go and take a look at our first example. And as mentioned before, in this video, we're going to use Stokes' theorem to evaluate a line integral. So we'll be given a line integral, and we'll convert it to a surface integral. Let's go and take a look at our first example. In this example, we want to evaluate the line integral of f dotted with dr with the given vector field, and c is the intersection of the plane y plus c equals 4 and the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. And we'll assume all the conditions of Stokes' theorem have been met. Let's start by taking a look at the graph of this. So our surface is the intersection of the yellow cylinder and the green plane. So we'll use Stokes' theorem to evaluate the given line integral, which will tell us the net rotation caused by the vector field, which is the intersection of the cylinder and the plane with a counterclockwise orientation, which is also equal to the net rotation of the vector field over the surface. And if it's positive, that means the net rotation would be counterclockwise. And if it's negative, the net rotation would be clockwise, based upon the given orientation. So to evaluate this line integral, we'll apply Stokes' theorem and evaluate this surface integral instead. So we'll start by determining the curl of the vector field F. So we can use a 3 by 3 determinant, where the first row will be i, j, k. The second row will be the partial derivative operators. The third row will be the components of our vector field. We'll go ahead and use the cofactor expansion method this time. 
So for our first two by two determinant, we'll eliminate row one and column one. For our second determinant, we'll eliminate row one and column two. And then for our third determinant, we'll eliminate row one and column three. So here we'll have the partial derivative of z squared with respect to y, that'll be zero, minus the partial derivative of x with respect to z, that's also gonna be zero. Here we'll have the partial derivative of z squared with respect to x, that's zero, minus the partial derivative of negative one-half y squared with respect to z, that's also zero. And then for our z component, we'll have the partial derivative of x with respect to x, that's gonna be one, minus the partial derivative of negative one-half y squared with respect to y, well, that's gonna be negative y, so minus the negative y will be plus y. So here's the curl of f. Now to evaluate the surface integral, we're gonna convert it to a double integral over the region r, and so we'll have the curl of f dotted with, this is the shortcut for the gradient of big G, where big G is equal to z minus g of x, y, or we can say that z is equal to g of x, y, which in this case, given by the plane, is gonna be equal to four minus y. So we'll use this for the shortcut of our second vector field. So we're gonna have the curl of f dotted with the opposite of the partial derivative of g with respect to x, well that's gonna be zero the opposite of the partial derivative of g with respect to y, well the partial derivative would be negative one, and then the opposite of that would be positive one, and then the z component is always equal to one, given our orientation. Let's go determine our dot product. So we have zero plus zero plus one plus y times one, that's gonna be one plus y. Now for differential A, let's go ahead and sketch our xy trace. Let's go back and take a look at our graph real quick. The xy trace of our surface, as you can see here, would just be this circle here determined by the cylinder. So let's go ahead and sketch that. Since our xy trace is a circle, we're probably gonna wanna use polar coordinates. But let's go ahead and sketch it. So for differential A, let's go ahead and rewrite this as r d r d theta, and then we'll use our sketch here to determine our limits of integration. So we'll have one plus y is equal to r sine theta. And remember that differential A in polar form would be r d r d theta. So the limits of integration for r would be from zero to one, and theta would be from zero all the way around to two pi. Let's go and evaluate this on the next page. Let's go and distribute here so we have r plus r squared sine theta. So we're gonna have r squared over two plus r cubed over three sine theta. Summing in r equals one, we'll have one half plus one third sine theta. And then when r is zero, we'd have zero. So we'll have one half theta minus one-third cosine theta. So when theta is equal to two pi, we'd have pi minus one-third time cosine two pi. Well, cosine two pi is one, so we'll have minus one-third 
minus, and then when theta is zero, we'd have zero minus one-third cosine zero, we'd have one-third again. So this simplifies to pi. Again, this is measuring the net rotation of the vector field across the surface, which is also equal to the net rotation along the boundary curve C. Going back to our graph just for a moment, since it's positive pi, that means the rotation would be counterclockwise the same way as the orientation of the curve. And it's kind of hard to tell based upon this vector field, but that's what that value is telling us. In part two, we'll take a look at using Stokes' theorem to evaluate a surface integral using a line integral. I hope you found this helpful.